The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. As I was just explaining to some of you, my name is uh, Ken Moore. I work on the PCBSD project, and we are sponsored by IX Systems. They're our corporate sponsor. Uh, PCBSD is a project to make FreeBSD easy, to make it easy to install, easy to run, easy to do, whatever it is you need to do with it. That's the best way to describe it. Uh, primarily designed as a desktop system so that you have a graphical interface with graphical tools for running and administering your system. It also has a server side called TrueOS, which is exactly the same as PCBSD, it's just the command line versions of all of our tools instead of the graphical versions. So all of our graphical versions really are just front ends to those CLI back ends. So, so just so you know, there's no difference between PCBSD and TrueOS at that respect. If the tool exists in PCBSD, the exact same tool is available in, in TrueOS, they're just a different interface, command line or graphical. Today, however, I want to talk about the PBI system. This is something that has been unique to PCBSD in quite a while. Specifically, I want to talk about the new version, version 10, that just came out recently. It's a quite a radical departure from our old versions, and I want to go through, show the differences between them and how useful and important this is for the future of PCBSD and application management in general. So first off, let me define what a PBI is. PBI is short for a push button installer. This was initially designed by Chris Moore when he first founded the PCBSD project because at the time in FreeBSD you only had the ports tree and the ports tree meant that you had to fetch all the sources, compile them all yourself, clean up afterwards and then it would you know, have it all installed and it just took a long time to get anything on your system. So he designed PBIs to be pre-built binaries that you can download and install onto your FreeBSD system easily without having to worry about doing all the compilation stuff or having a strong, powerful system. You could just get a single file, stick it on a USB stick if you needed to, and move it over to your low-powered system and install it there. Very nice and simple, easy push-button installer. That is the premise for it. Um, <laughs> So for an example tool chain for what I have here to create a push button installer, or really, you know, let's just say application management in general, you always have to start with building the application from some kind of source, be this by a proprietary you know, distributor, they compile it themselves, and then they just release the binaries. So you wouldn't see this step. But in the open source world, most often you do see this step. Fetch the sources, compile it. After that, you package up that application. So all those binaries that that application needs, all the extra files, configuration files, whatever it may be, you want to package them together into some kind of format so that they can be distributed. And then finally, and this is usually the end user step, downloading that package, installing it, and using it. So that's kind of the whole point of having the application. So you want to try and make this as easy of a process as possible. And PBI were designed specifically for that, to try and make the entire process easy, not just focus on one of the little pieces. But, so let's go through each of these three pieces individually first, and then we'll get into more of the graphical stuff and end user stuff that will be a lot more easy to see. So first off, for source builds, the old PBI system and the new PBI system, they're both, again, still based off of FreeBSD ports. On FreeBSD, the ports tree is the de facto standard. If you want to have applications on FreeBSD, make sure there is a port in the ports tree. That is the way to register that, hey, this application works on FreeBSD. It's not just some little Linux thing that was over here that requires Linux kernel calls and stuff like that. It actually runs, okay? The old system, however, used a very special system base. It did not compile things assuming that they, that they would be installed into user local. Instead, it used a special variant of user PBI and then 
the application dash architecture, for instance. This was to keep applications separate from the main system because the premise was that you keep your main system, since it rarely changes on FreeBSD, you want it as stable and secure as possible. So they would install a release, let's say 7.0, and you had FreeBSD 7.0 with a small collection of packages that was stable and never touched. It would never break on you because you never touched it. All your end user applications would be installed into this custom location user PBI to be kept separately and be able to update it regularly, again, without touching or breaking your main system. That was the idea behind it. With the new system, however, we don't have to worry about breaking the main system so much. The FreeBSD packaging methods have come such a long ways that people want to be able to keep their main system up to date all the time as well as just a couple third-party applications that you use and people want that type of integration. So we've now gone to the standard user local system base. This is incredibly important because it means that all of your applications are built and compiled to run within the exact same environment depending on each other. So there you have the dependency soup. And I'll talk about the packages in a moment and how that deals with it. The other main difference to point out here though is that the compilation options in the old system were set on an individual application basis. This meant if you installed, say, Firefox and it needed Perl with some particular dependency, that particular Perl dependency would only be included with the Firefox application. If you needed Perl with some other application, you might not have that same dependency or that same option set for Perl with that other application. They were completely separate and independent entities. So each application and all its dependencies was independent than this application and all its dependencies. They had their own dependency trees is the best way to think about it. Now, however, all the compilation options are set for individual applications on a system-wide basis. So if you set an option for Perl to have some particular bit turned on, then that particular bit is assumed to be turned on for every application on the system, not just that one individual end user application. So it's just a slightly different way of thinking about it, but it does bite people occasionally if they're not familiar or aware of the differences. Next step, the packaging. Again, in the old system, there was a FreeBSD package system, if you could call it that. It was very kind of unmaintained, very old. It wasn't, it wasn't very useful. So the PBI system provided the packages. It did all the packaging itself with its own special format where it compiled everything, the application and the files, into a single file to be distributed called a .pbi. This is why if you look on our forums and stuff, you'll see lots of people that refer to PBIs. A P this is where the name got, came from. A PBI was a application and it was distributed as one file. This meant that you had a large file size. For instance, the Firefox PBI. It was roughly 250 megabytes because it wasn't just Firefox in that PBI. It was Firefox and GTK and you know, all these other dependencies that Firefox needed in order to run. It was all of it compackaged into one file. Um, this meant that when you had to go download it, you were always downloading a massive file for applications in the old PBI format. All right. Not a problem for people with really fast internet access, but a lot of our users are overseas in places with dial-up speeds. And large file sizes are incredibly bad for them, especially if they're facing like rate limits and stuff like that. So with version 10, we've shifted things around a little bit. We're using the new FreeBSD package ng system for packaging. It's a standardized system. It works on all of FreeBSD, and they have a number of really good and efficient tools now for producing these packages on a mass level. So we run our own packaging servers, so we do the packaging and sign the packages and all of that for the PCBSD project exclusively, and we have our own package repository of the entire FreeBSD ports tree with our own special options, which are probably different from the FreeBSD ports tree or the official FreeBSD package repository usually because we just like to turn on most everything. Since we're talking about end user applications, you don't want to worry about, oh, I need this application, but oh, that bit wasn't flipped in some dependency, so I can't use this graphical. 
That's what often happens in the FreeBSD package repository. In the PCBSD package repository, we tr just turn on a lot of the options by default so that everything has access to it at all times if it needs it. Um, what this gains us is, one, we have a really small file sizes now. Each package, instead of being the application and all its dependencies, is now just the application. So the Firefox PBI from 250 megabytes now is a Firefox package of, what, 15, 20 megabytes or something like that? Much smaller chunks, but you now require an internet connection because you have to then, after you get that package, see what dependencies it needs and download whatever ones you don't already have installed on your system. So it's, it's another step, it distributes it out, but it means usually that you don't end up downloading as much as the original PBIs because you might have a number of the dependencies already installed in your system. You don't need to re-download or reinstall those ones. They're already there. So it just helps clean things up a little bit. It's a little bit messier in the back end, but the end user experience is a lot cleaner and more streamlined. Now what about installation? In the old PBI system, not only were the applications and dependencies in a single file, they were installed into a separate area on the system. Again, keeping that distinction from applications to system. Now, um, we have a few different methods. We support a few of them. Uh, first is CINA system integrated. This is standard to what you would have on like your Linux or standard Unix systems where I install application A, it can see applications B, C, D, E, you know, everything else on the system. They all coexist in the same soup. That is, that is the default method now for the new PBIs. And the other one is also FreeBSD jails. FreeBSD, I'll talk more about FreeBSD jails later, but they're basically containers that you can now install and run applications from. They've been around in FreeBSD for a long, long time, but the App Cafe can now manage and use them in a very, very smart way. And then other containers. Because it's an overarching uh, system now, we can add multiple or different types of installation methods. If we want to reinstitute some other type of container, we could do that easily without having to change the entire PBI system again. It makes it a lot more uh, pluggable. So people can just say, oh, I want this application and I want to install it this way. Make it nice and simple, as simple as possible for the end user, a push button installer. So here's just to summarize all the technical stuff that we just had to go over and then we'll get to the nice stuff that the end user actually sees. So in the old PBI system, you can see kind of how it was graphically laid out. You had the PBIs, you had the systems, you had the jails. They were all independent of each other. They all did not interact very well with each other. And while they were all based on FreeBSD, they quite often had a lot of duplication between them, between different methods, either packaging methods or installation methods or libraries that were being loaded into memory or, or whatnot. There was often duplication. With PBI version 10, excuse me, <coughs> um, the PBI system is now an overarching methodology for the entire system. It runs the jails, it runs the system, it runs other types of application installations. So it helps to minimize all the duplication and streamline the process for anybody to use the system however they see fit. All right, now how does the user interact with that new PBI system? PBIs with package NG is what we're calling them, or internally we've referred to them as PBI NG, next generation PBIs, because we're imaginative like that. So here is the graphical interface that you get on PCBSD. It is called the App Cafe. It is the graphical interface for users to interact with it. It allows simple access to different installation methods or locations. Let me see, how well, can you see there at the top of the screenshot how you have the system, you have the jail options up there at the top? System is selected by default and that would mean that you are going to be installing or you are looking at what is installed into the general system at large. And then if you wanted to install into a jail, you could just hit the little jail button and select whatever jail you needed. Um, no, thank you. Um, so that's, that's how it's easy to select what installation options you want. When we add more installation options, I can just add more to the toolbar. So just a couple more options you can select and choose whatever you want. 
This is just the home page. I mean, it's, it's very generic, but you know, just some different applications that were highlighted. These are completely randomized applications pulled out of the repository saying, hey, this might be useful for you. And then at the bottom, we have, these are recommendations that the PCBSD dev team recommend. We use these on a regular basis. They work really well. These are the ones that we like for particular uh, aspects. And then some new applications and stuff on the right. Well. If we keep going, how do we manage them? If you go to the Installed tab, you can easily see all the different applications that you have installed. In this case, again, I'm looking at the general system. So you can see I have Firefox there, I have GIMP, I have LibreOffice, I have all sorts of stuff. I can easily see, select, and remove options as well. None of this is dependent upon the system, or required for the system. These are all third-party things I can add and remove at will without worrying about breaking my system or destroying system stability or anything like that. So some of the options that you have here is, one, you can show just applications. That's kind of what's on by default, and that's what you're seeing here. There are also a couple other options. Um, pa orphan packages. These are what if you installed application A, but some dependency got left behind, which is just sitting there that nothing's using. That would be an orphan. So you can go through and filter those. Those should be getting removed automatically, but just in case, we give you the option to see if there's any around. Base packages, that will show you other ones which are required by the base system. They won't let you remove them, but they will let you see all sorts of, general, of information about those base system packages, like what version they are, who they were developed by, when they were installed, you know, stuff like that. And then what we call raw packages. Uh, PBIs are, package ng packages plus a lot of extra information. So if it has that extra information is what we're referring to it as a PBI. If it doesn't have that extra bit of information, we refer to it as a raw package, a raw package ng package for FreeBSD. And you can trigger those as well. That's where if you look at the bottom of the screenshot, you'll see applications available, what is it, 2,175. Total packages, however, is 23,350. Again, PCBSD tries to make sure the applications are the focus. Those are the ones that get PBIs made so you can easily search and add and install whatever you're looking for. While there's still all the other thousands upon thousands of packages which you could install for special uses like certain libraries or stuff that you might not want as an end user just installing you know, a web browser, but as a developer, say you need a particular library for something, then you'd go into the raw package view and say, I need lib whatever, and then you could find it and install it that way. Just again, helping to distinguish what's useful for the end user, you know, for mom and dad out back who need to install one thing, they don't wanna be able to see lib foo or whatever. They don't want all their searches cluttered up by that. They just wanna see the applications. Couple of the other actions you can do from here, you can uninstall applications, you can add and remove desktop shortcuts. So if you want a shortcut to that application on the desktop, you can do all that right from here. And you can also lock an application. Say you have Firefox 23 dot whatever it is, and you really like it, and you heard that version 24 dot whatever breaks something that you need. Well, you can just come in here and lock the version. So whenever you perform updates of your system, it will never update Firefox. That one is locked. It will keep that, that application at that particular version for the entire time. So it lets you customize your system and make sure to keep particular older versions if you need it. All right, so that's all the installed tab. Well, what about looking for apps? There are thousands of apps available. How do you go through and find them? First option is simple, you browse through the categories and see what's there. There might be a lot there, but at a glance, we tried to make this as easy as possible. So you have your summaries of all the apps whenever you're browsing, so you can easily see its name, what kind of rating it has by the PCBSD users. Is it, recommend, is it one of the ones recommended by the PCBSD team? Uh, is it currently installed? What type of application is it? Is it a graphical application? Is it a command line application? Is it a server? you know, utility. It just trying to add all those filtering options. So if you look at the screenshot for Qt Creator, for instance, you can see that one's got five stars. Um, the little red metal there means it's got a PCBSD stamp of recommendation. That is something that is recommended by the PCBSD team. 
The little white box means it's a graphical application and it's got a green checkbox. It's already installed. So at a glance, I can see, oh, I don't need to click on that because I've already got it installed, but I like it. So what if I only want graphical applications? Well, there are tons of filtering options. If at the very top, there's what we call a browser view. And you can say, I only want to see graphical applications. I only want to see text-based applications. I only want to see servers. I only want to see you know, other packages, the raw packages, and stuff like that. So it makes, we're trying to make it as simple as possible for people to go through these massive databases of applications and, and libraries that are available to find the particular one that you're looking for. One of the other ways that we can do this is by searching. If in the upper right corner of the browser, we have a search option where you can search for a particular term. It's actually a live search. So as soon as you hit three characters or more, it'll start searching if you stop typing for half a second. And it'll do the search for you really quickly. And it'll just keep it updated while you're typing. And it searches by name. So for instance, say, I think here I typed in desktop. So the first thing it finds and lists as best matches are things with desktop in the name. If there was an application just called desktop, and that's it, exactly desktop, that would always be at the top of the list. What I always use as an example is when I was in grad school, I had a professor who absolutely loved R. If you ever you know about R, it's a numerical suite, calculation suite and stuff. It's incredibly difficult to search for anywhere you go because it's one letter. It's just R. Well, in the App Cafe, if you just type in R and hit enter, it might take a little bit longer because it's finding a whole lot more matches. But the application R, since it's an exact match of the name, will always show up right at the top of the list. It makes it very easy to find it if you know the name of the application you're looking for. But say it's not in the name, if it's in like the description or tags, you know, because we add additional tags to applications saying, oh, uh, let's say HexChat. It's an IRC client, so we'll give it tags of IRC, chat, uh, and you know, what other, other tags, common search tags that people might look for to help make this application show up. And then those will be listed in other results, so you can browse through those again. Again, making it easy to see the applications as well as if it's installed, is it recommended, is it a good application, does it have five stars, you know, things like that. All, everything to make it easy for the user to use. Now, what if you click on an application? Here I've got Inkscape. All right. You have many options. You have the big button that says Install Now. It is a PBI. You can hit one big red button. Well, it's not red. But you can hit one button to install the application onto your system and have it done in relatively little time. It really depends on how fast your internet access is to download the necessary packages it needs. And then you also have all sorts of stuff, stuff there. It'll list the description of the application, the full description. If there are screenshots listed for it, it'll open up that tab and say, hey, there's screenshots for it too. Or plugins. If there are known plugins for this application, it will give you links to all the other packages which act as plugins for this. Um, similar applications, other ones that might be similar to this would be drawing applications like XPaint or GIMP or you know, things like that. And then if there were any custom build options, you won't be able to change them, but you can at least see them from here. So all those compilation options that I talked about earlier, they're static. They were already compiled with a specific set of build options, so at least you can see what it is for this particular application. Plus all the other things, you know, download size, version, stuff like that. All the, all the important stuff for the user. And this is all before it's installed. What if it is installed? Then it'll look very similar, but there's a number of other options available. You'll see, for one, the install, installed button is grayed out because it's already installed. But you gain a few other buttons. One, the ability for the App Cafe to actually run that application. You don't need desktop icons. You don't need a special desktop environment or menu system. You can just use the App Cafe to launch your applications. Two, you can contact your maintainer. Say you run into a problem with that particular application or that version of that application. If there's a bug in it, you can always send an email to the maintainer. Say, hey, I noticed this. And in the maintainer that the App Cafe generates, it'll automatically list the stats of that PBI, of that application, for the maintainer. So you don't have to manually remember, oh, yeah, this was application 1.43. What you, know. you don't have to do that. The PBI will add it all to the end of your email really quick when it generates that for you. 
And then finally, again, another link to shortcuts if you want to install or remove desktop shortcuts for this. Again, everything we can think of to make it easy for the user to use applications on a FreeBSD system. And here, again, I showed an, I showed an example of screenshots as well, since I could. <laughs> So we've got a full screenshot there. There's only one listed for Inkscape right here. Or, sorry, this is GIMP. For GIMP here, there's only one screenshot, but if there were more, the arrows would light up and you can cycle between them. And if you actually hit the one over one button, you can make it full screen if you wanna. If it's a little small for you, you can always make it larger so you just see what it looks like. Again, giving you all sorts of options before you install an application rather than requiring you to install it to see if you like it. All right, now I've talked a lot about the system stuff. Now I wanted to focus a little bit on the jails that I mentioned earlier. FreeBSD jails have been around for quite a number of years. What is it, 10 years, I think, true? 12 years? So they are basically, well, let's look at the tip. This is the easiest way to think about it. Think of it as a full virtual machine, but with such low overhead that you can run hundreds of them at the same time, all right? I believe there's something new in Linux called containers, some kind of containers or whatever. It would be, those are trying to clone the FreeBSD jails or copy the FreeBSD jails. That's the best way to think about it. But, so what is it? It's a self-contained system environment, FreeBSD system environment. It has its own independent root and users. So if you log into a jail, it can have a completely different root user than the root on the main system. It is completely independent. It is a completely secure environment. Systems and processes and users that are within the jail cannot break out of the jail to see the main system. They cannot get out whatsoever. This has actually resulted in many people using FreeBSD, specifically FreeBSD jails, as honeypots. They put a web server in, in a jail, make it deliberately insecure in some way, and then they sit back and they watch people as they hack into it to see what they're going after, what they're gonna break, how they broke into it, you know, things like that. Because, hey, it's a jail. I can just delete it, recreate it, roll it back. You know, it's, it's, it's throwaway, it's, it's temporary. And it also has a, a distinct IP and host name too. So it gets its own IP address, it gets its own host name, it is not identified on the network as the exact same system as the host system either. So again, there are many, many different things about jails which are very nice. Some of the big features about it though. One, it has an extremely low overhead. As I mentioned, you can run many hundreds of these on a decent system simultaneously. You cannot say the same thing about VirtualBox VMs. Usually if I run one, maybe two of those at the same time, I'll start slowing my system to a crawl or crashing it. All right. Uh, you can start and stop jails. So you can either have it running with all of its services and stuff, or you can have it be stopped and just be a collection of files on your main system. And finally, invisible oversight. Again, with the honeypot aspect, you don't need to be logged into the jail in order to see what's going on with it. On a FreeBSD system, if you're an access, you're a user on the main system, you can actually look into the jail invisibly without users inside the jail knowing that you're viewing them. This, again, makes it useful for things like network security analysis and threat detection and stuff like that. So, PCBSD provides a utility called the Warden in order to help manage and facilitate jails. See what we did there? <laughs> so, what we can do is, again, it has all the standard FreeBSD jails, but it adds a few nice little benefits to it as well. One of them being the ability to import and export jails. So if you set up a jail that you really, really like, it's got everything that you need, you can stop it, export it, which turns it into a single file dot with a dot WDN extension for dot warden. Take that file, throw it on a USB stick, and move to some other systems running FreeBSD or PCBSD <laughs> specifically. And then just say, oh, warden, I want you to import that, and it, you'll have a brand new jail on that system. Completely configured as you had, it's just identical. So if you've got a commercial system where you've got, say, 50 different systems all needing to run identical jails, you can just set up one template, put it on a USB stick, and there you go. There's your copy for every single other system. Very easy to duplicate, very easy to send and get set up on all your other systems. It makes a very nice jail management utility. In addition, Warden has ZFS integration so that 
when not only do you have jails, you have jails on ZFS. You can schedule or manually take ZFS snapshots of a jail, and then if, for instance, let's say it's a web server that does get hacked, it does get destroyed, somebody got in there and defaced your favorite dog's website or something like that, you could just say, oh, I don't like that, but I don't want to take four hours trying to track down every single change that they made in there. I'm just going to take the entire jail, roll it back to yesterday. There we go, problem solved. And then maybe I'll go in there and you know, change whatever it was that they used to hack into it. But it gives you a very easy method to roll back and fix jails whenever you would need. And you can set up snapshot schedules however you want on a daily, regular basis, or just manually whenever you say, OK, I think now would be a good time for a snapshot. It's completely up to you. And finally, the warden gives you a few different types of jails as well. You have the traditional jail, which is pure FreeBSD, extremely secure, but really only works with text-based applications, with command line applications. Um, PCBSD also adds ports jails. This is a regular jail, but it is designed specifically for running graphical applications. It is a little less secure than the traditional jail because it does let the jail get out a little bit to talk to the graphical server on your main system to display graphics. It also makes um, NullFS mounts of the user's home directory into it. So if you're going to run, say, a web browser in a ports jail, you want to make sure that it can see your home directory so that you can save files to my downloads or things like that. So you still have that layer of compatibility between your system and graphical applications while keeping them separate. And then finally, there's Linux jails. This is an experimental feature, but it's running Linux on FreeBSD with the FreeBSD kernel. And in the few tests that we've done with installing, I believe it is Gentoo, and there's one other script we have to install a Linux distro in there, it actually works quite well. You'd be impressed. FreeBSD, for those of you that don't know, has a Linux compatibility layer built in that lets it run Linux binaries pretty much out of box as long as it adheres to you know, whatever layer of compatibility you're talking about. Fedora 10 is, Fedora Core 10 is the default at the moment. They're working on a CentOS 6 compatibility as well. So again, options. PCBSD via the warden gives you options for jails in addition to the standard tried and true FreeBSD jail system that's been around for many, many years. So what, how does the App Cafe use them? App Cafe just has a couple notes about jails. One, the jails has to be running for the App Cafe to be able to see it. Otherwise, it's just a collection of files on the system and it doesn't know it's there. So you can tell the warden to say, oh, every time I start up my system, I want you to start jails X, Y, Z. That, that's easy, so just make sure that they're running. OK. Um, question. Yes, the, the question was whether you can get a do ZFS send and receive on the jails as well. And I believe you can, yes. And that is actually ZFS send and receive is the way that PCBSD uses for replications, for data backups and stuff like that. So you might not want to use it with the jails itself, although you could if you do it manually. We have a, a utility called Life Preserver in PCBSD that does all sorts of this for you. But yes, you could. All right, where was I? Here we go, App Cafe Jails. Um, this is the big, big thing, red flag warning that you have to know about whenever you're managing jails from within the App Cafe. If you install an application into a jail with the App Cafe, it will change the package repository configuration in the jail to match that of the main system. The App Cafe is using the repo configuration on the main system for everything, to how to read the database, what applications are available, everything like that. 
So in order to install things into the jail as well, it needs to make sure that the jail sees the same thing that the app, app cafe sees. So it will synchronize those two package configurations. That's kind of the big red, red flag warning. So if you have a special jail that points to a different package repository somewhere in Australia or whatever, you don't want to use the app cafe to install things into there. However, you can update those jails safely without touching the existing package repository. So you can open up the app cafe and at the top of the screen it'll say, hey, updates are available. You can just click the button and it'll update everything for you. And before doing any update on a PCBSD system, it will actually create a boot environment for you as well. So that if anything goes wrong with that update, if application X became completely broken and that was essential for my workflow at company Y, all you have to do is restart your computer and say, I want to go to the previous boot environment and you're back to your system the way it was five minutes before the update or whenever it was. Makes it very nice and simple and safe to perform updates of your PCBSD systems without worrying about losing your weekend because some application broke. And you can do jail uh, updates not just on the main system but also in each of the jails through here as well. All right, so here's just a summary of some of the improvements and some of the new features that the new system with the App Cafe brings to the table for PCBSD systems. One, stability. You no longer have applications installed and running in their own custom local base when there might be hard-coded things within the application expecting user local and causing all sorts of system instability and just general messiness. That was one of the main things preventing us from getting above a few hundred applications in the old PBI system because so many of them have hard-coded links to specific areas of the file system assuming they're going to be installed in particular ways that we were not doing. Uh, second one, simplicity. One system to manage the entire, entire package application management. No more worrying about the App Cafe here, the System Package Manager here, the System Updater over here, and all you know, figuring out how all these tools interact with each other. You just have one place to go for everything on the system. And then it adheres more to standards too. It's using the underlying FreeBSD Package NG system. So whenever Package NG gets updated with some brand new snazzy feature, hey, we got it too. It's all pulled in at the same time. So some of the new features, one. I mentioned this before, support for multiple installation methods. You're no longer forced to assume that every single application is installed into a separate container like with the old PBIs. Now it will behave in a more traditional Unix fashion of the system slush, as I like to call it. That is the default. If you want to have containers, install it into a jail. Install it into a port jail. Not only will you get better security and better reliability of the application, but you're also deliberately knowing that it will not be integrated into the base system like you know, something installed the other way. It is kept separate. Uh, application plugin support. Before, with that single file, you couldn't add additional packages and plugins to them because it was a standalone file. You couldn't add to it, you couldn't remove from it, it was self-contained. Now, you can actually say, oh, I've got Ruby here, but I need a Ruby module. Well, now you can just go install the module instead of having to rebuild the entire PBI, oh, and throw that module in too. Uh, version locking, if you want to keep old versions, and then all sorts of ap application info that is not available on general FreeBSD packages. Ratings, tip, user tips, screenshots, all sorts of stuff like that. So it's just, just some of the new features and improvements that come with the new PBI system and why we are so excited here at the PCBSD team to be able to do this and make a much more reliable, much easier system to manage. What if you want to get involved? Well, there's a couple ways for that. Say you see an icon that's wrong for an application or something. Hey. All of our modules, the information, the extra information for an application, it's available on our GitHub page. You can just go there and say, oh, make a change, submit it to us, and we'll say, oh, okay, let's look at that. Oh, yep, that looks good, and we'll apply it, and it'll go out you know, the next time the package, packages get built. So it lets you very easily make changes and submit and do help stuff without ever having to get out of a web browser. 
everything on GitHub you can actually do in their in-text editor or in what in-page editor. And then what if the app cafe is missing an application that you particularly want? Well, add it to the FreeBSD ports tree. We build everything from the ports tree, so if you add it there, we'll get it. And then maybe we'll just throw together a module to give it all that nice extra little information, an icon, a screenshot, you know, all, all the niceties. But those are very easy ways to get involved in system application distribution for everybody. Now, do you have any questions? Yes? So how does um, AppCafe interact with packaging Are you actually, actually able to see the command that it's running, or is it using uh, an underlying API? We are actually running package commands within wrappers to do all the other things and keep PackageNG sane. We have actually been um, one of the earliest adopters of PackageNG and have been doing most of the bug testing for it when it was in, in its infancy before it hit the main FreeBSD ports tree. And we work very closely with BAPT, the guy who developed PackageNG, to keep things sane. And some of the things that we do is making sure that it doesn't delete something required by the base system. We've seen that issue before, and it causes an absolute mess. So we have all sorts of sanity checks and, and safeguards in place to make sure that, again, using package through the app cafe is safe. That's just one of the things. But at, at its core, though, we are running package. Just, any other questions first? OK, I'll go back to you. <laughs> uh, the read, so the metadata for the PBI is in GitHub, but what about the ratings and stuff like that? Where is that? OK, the ratings are actually done through the PCBSD wiki. If you click on those pages in the App Cafe, it will simply launch your, web, your favorite web browser to our wiki URL. So if you create an account on the wiki, you can rate applications, you can write down tips for things, and it will all be right there on our wiki. What our build server does then is it goes through and it pulls specific things from the wiki regarding ratings and then compiles them all into collective numbers and stuff for the App Cafe to be able to use later. Is that only queryable via the App Cafe or can you get to that some other way? Um, you can access it directly from the wiki as well. Yeah. This is just an interface to send you to the wiki and saying, hey, you can do all that over here. But the information of what was on the wiki at the time that the packages were made can be seen in the App Cafe. Yes, sir. So I'm, I'm assuming uh, this would impact quite a bit uh, automation. Uh, obviously, is there some new mechanism for, to enable that? Uh, automation of what? Installing packages, removing packages? Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, that was a pretty trivial thing to, to install a uh, mm -hmm. script or something like that. Yeah. Um, how's that um, changed? Um, it's exactly the same, actually. If you want to install a PBI, it simply does a little bit more in the back end. It keeps track of all its dependencies, checks against what's already installed in the system, and installs any of them that are missing. Yeah, there was the version locking method. If there's something that you particularly want on the system that you want locked at a particular version so that other stuff can change, but that one thing cannot, you can go ahead and lock it. And you can do that with tons of them. I haven't tried to see what will happen if you go through and lock every single application on your system and then try to update. But I mean, we'll see. <laughs> I assume it would work just fine. Because the base system will always keep updating. Um, one thing I didn't neglect to mention in the App Cafe, which is actually a holdover from the old days, which is still valid, is that there was the ability to export a list of all the current PBIs you have installed on your system, and then just take that list and import it on another PCBSD system, and so it will automatically queue up the installation of all the applications missing on that system. That still exists in this. You can still say, get your system set up exactly as you want, export that list of applications, and then just take that simple text file, import it into the App Cafe and another system, and it will say, okay, you want applications you know, A through Z. 
I see that you have five of these already installed. So I'll skip those, but I'll queue up and start installing the rest of them for you. And it'll all be seen there. It'll say pending, pending installation, pending installation, and then it'll go through and install them all for you. So that all can be automated just through that mechanism if you would like. Similarly, the PBI underscore add command line utility that we have had in the past is still there in the back end. If you want to run it from command line and script your own PBI installations, you can do that. The interface to the PBI system via command line is exactly the same. Yes, sir. So talk to me about the binary file format. FreeBSD is known for being portable, right? Is, are the binary files multi architecture? Binary files for FreeBSD are locked only to the particular major version of FreeBSD. So binary files compiled on FreeBSD 10.0 will work on FreeBSD 10.1 and 10.2 and 10.3 and any 10.x FreeBSDs there are. It's only as soon as you go to a different major version number like FreeBSD 9 or FreeBSD 11 that those will no longer be compatible without installing some kind of special compatibility layer. Similarly, if you go to architecture, there are Obviously, 32-bit, 64-bit, I think there's a few ARM architectures, and there's a bunch of other architectures that FreeBSD also supports as well. PCBSD is 64-bit exclusive. We don't build anything that's not 64-bit. But the 64-bit systems have complete compatibility for 32-bit applications as well. So if you've compiled a 32-bit binar FreeBSD binary for FreeBSD 10, it will run on a 64-bit FreeBSD 10, no problem. Any other questions? All right, going once, going twice. Thank you very much for coming, and I hope you have drop by the booth later. We have tons of DVDs of PCBSD available, as well as free NAS, and we'll take your questions there and answer anything we can. Thank you. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.